Good morning. Welcome to the last session in the um, 50th anniversary of the um, Sydney B. Sperry Symposium. We're very um, excited for our last um, speakers here because this is, this is a great way of sort of bringing home some of the doctrinal lessons of the Old Testament, really giving a sense of, of what we can do to um, live the covenant of compassion that the Lord teaches us in the scriptures. Robin Peterson lives in Arizona with her husband and children. Her passion for storytelling stems from her deep love of history. While attending Brigham Young University, where she obtained a Bachelor of Arts in History, she had the opportunity to intern at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Professionally, storytelling plays a large role for Robin as she provides deep-rooted family connections through her work as a professional geolo genealogist. Excuse me, Researching for shows such as Who Do You Think You Are? The importance of telling and preserving individual stories led her to join Their Story is Our Story in 2019 to serve as the Director of Archives. Robin also spends time volunteering with various refugee organizations in the Phoenix area. In her free time, Robin enjoys hiking, trail running, paddle boarding, and weightlifting. Dr. Elisabetta Jevtek Samlai, or simply Liz, currently resides in Arizona and has lived in many places. She holds a BA in International Relations, a BA and an MA in German Holocaust Studies, as well as a PhD in International Conflict Analysis. She's a passionate advocate for human rights, more specifically, minority, refugee, women, and children's rights, and has presented, researched, and published on the topic of long-term reintegration. She comes to Their Story is Our Story with extensive professional experience in operations and policy development at the UN level, and in curriculum and course design and teaching in higher education. Before joining Their Story is Our Story, she was a visiting professor here at BYU from 2015 to 2017. As a refugee herself, Liz knows, that, Liz knows that life is precious. True to her roots, Liz is always ready for a good laugh, loves engaging young minds in meaningful discussions, spending time with her family, and embracing new cultures, people, and food. And they will speak to us about the importance of Leviticus and Exodus in understanding why their story is our story. Thank you so much. You can all hear me, right? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I'm just gonna do a Verizon yeah. commercial for you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Good. Okay. <clears throat> um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for being here. We are honored to be allowed to be here um, at the Sperry Symposium that we were invited to present and also that um, our paper was included in this, in this uh, incredible volume. And uh, we are honored to be able to stand before you and to share a little bit about their stories, our story, and to share about you how God used his children, all of his children. Um, I want to apologize up front if we like fumble and tumble and we just had a, a few days of a lot of lecturing. So we are a little bit emotional at this point and a little bit of tired. So um, if something doesn't make sense, go read the book. <laughs> it will all come clear. Um, as well, second thing I want to do is um, I am so grateful to be part of this uh, um, organization. And I want to let you know that while Robin and myself are standing here presenting to you, um, all of the TSOS volunteers are um, with us within their hearts. And they are all part of this, uh, this uh, chapter that we have in here. Many of them that have dedicated time and uh, money and sacrifice of their own to be able to collect some of the stories we're presenting to you today and also to make it possible for us to be here. And a few of them are sitting here. And so I want to thank them for supporting us in this effort. Um, I also want to, and here's where I start crying um, already. I want to honor um, those who have entrusted us with their stories so that we can share them with you. Um, they come to us at a very vulnerable time in their lives and the things that they share are hard um, and very, very difficult to share. Um, and I know that as a refugee myself, it is hard to share some of these stories. And so I want to make sure that we all are aware of the fact that we are dedicating this to all of the refugees. <clears throat> The marginalized and disadvantaged reside in the shadows of society's comforts, 
in the bustle of our daily routine, we strangers remain unseen, hidden from our view. And are oftentimes forgotten, but not to God. He establishes early on in his dealings with the children of Israel that those whom society shuns are ever present in his view. God often chooses personalized imagery and narratives for his prophets to vividly teach his people how these strangers in actuality are a reflection of his very own people and need to be treated as such. <clears throat> this is probably as much as I'm going to read from the book. You got to read it yourself for that. So God chooses personalized imagery and he shows us through that imagery and through the narrative that he uses that we are all connected. We're all children of God. And while there is the chosen uh, children of Israel, he still loves all of his children in this world. And um, what I love about this is that even within the Old Testament, when I was young and I would read the Old Testament, I would always be like, Phew, I'm not sure I understand what's going on here. But as I, you know, as I grew older and as I searched and I pondered um, and I prayed about it, you see so much more um, coming out in the Old Testament than you think is really there. And so here are two scriptures that I've put up here. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. And this is in Exodus. And then we have the Leviticus. The stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of God. I am the Lord your God. I think this is very powerful imagery. Um, God references to children of Israel that they also were strangers. He points back to the story when they were at that vulnerable moment in order to entrust them and to sort of raise an emotional response within them when they deal with other strangers that will be coming to their land, to the chosen land of Israel. <clears throat> so what is the message that he's trying to share with his uh, children at this point, the children of Israel? So we discuss in the paper, four points that he would like to like them to learn and like them to actually um, create an, into, an, an, into movement, into an actionable item to use in their life. And because we don't have time to talk through all of them, we're going to reference to every one of them. And then we will point out to just a couple of things. Um, so very first thing, thing that God does in, in his imagery, in his narratives, through the Old Testament and specifically through the Leviticus verses is this fact of deconstructing the notion of us versus them. And that is a very powerful, very beautiful imagery um, that he sh show, shows this idea of, of mirroring and reflection of another and imperfection of another being as similar to the imperfections that we hold and what we are to do with that. <clears throat> Then obviously a very powerful statement that he makes that we are all aware that goes through the whole scriptures um, is the, the idea of loving a stranger as we would love ourselves. The idea that we should exercise kindness, not only because it's, you know, it's, he likes to torture us with being kind to other people, but because it is actual path to holiness. It is something that helps us become better followers of Christ. And ultimately this is the whole, you know, part of why we're here on this earth. It is to become like God. So he is actually asking us to try and imitate his act until we become what he is. And then he teaches us this idea that for God, remembrance is a very important aspect. And if you look through the scriptures, all through the scriptures, he talks about this remembrance. When you read the stories of the different people, it is all as a part of remembering. And in the verses that I read to you before, he does the same thing. He's calling upon them. Remember, you were stranger in the land of Egypt yourself. And what does that remembrance then do for you as a person, as an individual? So we will focus a little bit more on talking about the love um, a stranger as thyself, but we'll highlight through the stories that we have also in the chapter, um, the other messages. So the main idea is that this act of loving the stranger is about removing the blindfolds of mortality that sometimes hold us, right? And through that, through the remembering of one another, 
we learn to remember them and to see them as God does. And through that, we then become a completely different person and we treat people differently. It is different when you meet someone and you treat them as a stranger or when you meet a friend and you treat them as a friend. <clears throat> All right, so before we start this, I just kind of want to tell you a little bit about who is a refugee, what is a refugee. We base all of our assumptions on the fact that while the, the exact word refugee is not you know, spelled out in the Leviticus um, um, sections and, and verses, the actual treatment and, uh, of, of a stranger includes someone that we would call a modern day refugee because the movement, right? And this uh, sort of a fleeing was a very, um, a very normal, I would say, think uh, in, in, in the um, ancient times, right? And it continues to be, the, the migration and the movement is something that has occurred all the time. Um, I just wanna read to you the definition of who is a refugee and elaborate on it a little bit. So um, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, so the Geneva, at the Geneva Conventions, defines someone as a refugee who, as a result of events that have occurred, and owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country. Or who, not having a nationality and being outside the country of his or her former habitual residence as a result of such events is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to return to it. So technically, um, we at TSOS see it that anyone who was forced to flee their home in order to survive fits into that category of a refugee. So it's not someone that just decided from one day to the next, oh, I would just love to live in this country, but someone who actually had to leave. And a lot of times this leaving it means also leaving without anything. No pictures of your family, no clothes, no memoralia that's gonna keep you back to this old place, but what you take it in your head. And that is a very hard thing to do. Just as a side note, as Robin and I were discussing this uh, presentation, we were talking about this idea of what it means um, in cultures where many of these refugees come from, home, house is something that has been occupied by generations of that family. And to have to leave it is such a detrimental thing that you know a lot of times in, in modern societies we don't even think about because we're so, you know, so um, accustomed to moving for a job to a different place or you know, just moving to a better home or a cheaper home or a bigger space. Or, and so it is something that we don't understand just how difficult it is sometimes to leave those four walls because they were built by a grandfather, a great grandfather. And so many, so many of the family were present in that home. This is just a picture to show you how a refugee looks like. Um, Behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed thee. Today, I think this scripture is just as relevant, re relevant as it was back then. Heavenly Father hears the oppression of his children and he responds and he responds by giving us the task to do something about it. So I'm gonna turn time over to Robin to tell us a little bit more about their stories, our story, and to lead us into the discussion on the first message. So in 2016, in April, Elder Kieran spoke a uh, refuge from the storm. And he and also Sister Burton spoke about being a stranger and what if their story was our story. And he echoes the Lord's reminder that the children of Israel were strangers in their own land. And he reinforced the notion that as an extension of the children of Israel through our own baptismal covenants, and as children of God, we need to consider the provisions and care and protections to ex extended to refugees. So, and Linda, Linda K. Burton also spoke in that same conference um, regarding what if their story were my story. So a group of like-minded 
writers, professional photographers, humanitarians, they took this as a call to action and they joined forces and several of the founders, or a few of the founders were in Europe as the influx of the, the Syrian crisis, the Syrian uh, refugee crisis because of the war that had been continuing for years and it just came to a head and the borders were just flooded with these people like Liz spoke about, the, the choice was not theirs to, to stay. They had to flee for their own safety and protection. So TSOS was born, their story is our story. And they began speaking with refugees and telling their stories in first person in order to remember. Um, and with these stories, sorry, <laughs> um, with these stories, they, they set out to maybe collect a dozen, a handful of stories. They collected on their very first trip to Greece about 70 interviews, 70 stories. And then over time, it just continued to evolve. And we currently just have hundreds of stories and interviews that we have done and thousands of pieces of photography and other, other items. So we approached Brigham Young University um, and the Scholars Archive, and they graciously donated unlimited database space to us to develop the Global Refugee Archive, which we launched this week to house and protect and preserve these stories, to remember them as in times of old. One of our founders spoke yesterday discussing the importance of story and how stories, if you look at scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, all scripture based on story and the story of the Israelites, the story of, of the Nephites, and embedded within those stories is the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of remembering and preserving and protecting, which helps close the gap between us versus them. <laughs> so the covenants that we have taken upon ourselves lead to the act of remembering his children as he remembers us. And even more importantly, to remember them as he does. Story gathering and story sharing become the act through which human families are bound to each other until they are all linked back to God. And that is the overarching goal of, of our existence here is to return back to God and to bring others with us. So this notion of deconstructing us versus them. Referring back to the Israelites, the suffering of the Israelites that they endured was central to their development of empathy and understanding for the plight of others. Therefore, we can see that God helped Israelites learn from their painful experiences how to be a blessing unto the nations. So in essence, it could be concluded that God, his hope for Israel, his chosen people, was that their story of migration and estrangement would create a holy and a just society. And we've been challenged by our, you know, our current prophets to continue to gather Israel. We are all part of Israel. And as we are seeing, you know, um, people um, at our southern border, as we're seeing this Afghan crisis unfold, those are parts of the gathering of Israel. We are all his children and we are all in, we are all in this together as, as tonight as that might sound. So we are, I'm going to share a couple stories um, that again, I'm only gonna share some excerpts um, the bulk of this, the remainder of the stories are within um, the paper, but they are also in the Scholars Archive at BYU in the Global Refu Refugee Archive, along with many others, and it's continually, continuing to build, and we're continuing to develop relationships with like-minded organizations to grow that archive to remember. So this is Lisa Campbell. 
she um, herself was drawn to work with refugees and she had never done so before, but she, she decided to go and work at a refugee camp. And I'm just going to read um, this portion of her story. Like most people in the US, I hadn't been aware of the scale of the refugee disaster until I saw for myself the piles of life jackets that we all saw um, on the news and the boats stacked on the beach. It was so hard to wrap my head around what I was seeing. It was hor I was horrified at the stories that I heard. There's probably not an emotion that I didn't experience standing there day after day on the shore in Greece. Watching the boats come in, I had no refugee experience, but I'm a doer. I ended up running the camp for 18 months until the Greek government shut it down. And from my perspective, this work is like being a mother. I've learned that love is a choice. When they, the refugees, were informed that the camp was closing, these people came to me and they said things like, you've been like a mother to me. I don't know what I'm going to do without you. And I realized that I have met my goal. Pardon. I was to take care of them and to show them that they are loved. And the residents of our camp felt like refugee had become a dirty word. But they're refugees because they want the same things in life that you and I want. We had engineers, lawyers, teachers, musicians, artists, police officers, people from all walks of life. They were just like you and me. So uh, one thing that I, I wanted to point out is that this first story, um, Lisa Campbell, right? It's, she deconstructed this notion of there's us, you know, it's them. So because it's them, I don't have to care about it, but they are like me, right? And that realization, they're like me, led her to this second point that she started to love them as she would love her own and as she would love herself. And uh, that is a beautiful concept. And I'm lucky. I'm seeing a couple of, I can't, I don't have my glasses, so I can't see all the way to the end, but I'm seeing a couple of people in this audience that um, have done similar for me, um, like Lisa Kempo has done for these refugees. And I know that because of their love in my life and in my journey as a refugee, I have been able to be a person that I am today, right? Um, while their, you know, their contribution might have been a very short, little, slim contribution in my span of a, a life story, um, it was, it actually occupies a huge space in my heart because they loved um, as, they, as they were charged by Heavenly Father. So what does this love mean? Um, Heavenly Father puts actually a code or a law for the Israelites, for the children of Israel at the time, what that love looks like because he was worried that maybe they would not know how to interpret it themselves. And so he puts it up here and creates all of the, lo the laws that they are to follow um, in regards to a stranger. And um, if we read in the scriptures, um, a lot of times uh, Heavenly Father will distinguish, when you look in the, the Hebrew text, he distinguishes between different types of a stranger. And they all had a different reference to, is this a stranger that's friendly, that is maybe just not within the covenant, is it someone who's coming from a totally different land? Is it someone you should be worried about, someone who wants to pervert your ways um, and looking into them? Um, and so, but he gives a stipulation of how you are to look at the stranger, the one that in Hebrew would be most closely referenced to today's term of a refugee. So his idea is that it's not a mere sentimental generalization, but it is an actual commandment that requires action it reacts to something from you so here are the list of things what the provisions that he gives uh, the children of israel comprehensive protection for foreigners from any and all forms of abuse and oppression protection from unfair treatment in court inclusion in sabbath rest inclusion in worship and covenant provision of fair employment practices access to agricultural produce or gleaning rights which is what we see in the story of ruth right equality before the law with native inhabitants. So you see here, Heavenly Father is actually giving some serious thought to this and some serious charge that we um, have today as well, right? It's reflected within the commandments and the, and the doctrine that we have been given. 
<clears throat> and so I alluded to the story and I wanted to talk a little bit more about the story of Ruth and Naomi because the interplay between these two women is absolutely uh, beautiful in, in my mind. We enter the story where Ruth is already a part of the household. And so let me just paint a picture of what's happening before. We have Naomi who comes with her, with her family many, many years before that. She herself is actually a refugee seeking um, seeking better life in Moab because the, the life where she lived back then with her family was just uh, not sustainable, right? So she comes and today we would deem her a climate refugee type of a thing. So she comes and her children, her sons marry women, local women there, and one of them happens to be Ruth, right? And as you know, as the story progresses, almost everyone is gone at some point of the time. Ruth, uh, I mean, Naomi stays alone and she really wants to go back home. And so she says to her, you know, to, to her um, daughters-in-law, I, I need to go back, but I don't know how they will treat you. So I, and you're young, you have prospects here. Stay here where you have a better opportunity. And we all know the famous statement that Ruth says to her, do not, do not ask me to leave you. I'm going to go where you're going. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And if you think in the refugee work, why is that so significant? All of these refugees are saying to you as well, your community will be my community. I will learn and I will respect and I will adjust to your customs and to your traditions. Let me be a part of it. And uh, so obviously we know Ruth goes over with her. And <clears throat> what God tells us with this story is look into the heart of that person because you don't know who is standing before you. Today, it might be a tiny little refugee kid with great aspirations and desires, but tomorrow he could be an incredible, powerful person. And in the story here, right? I mean, if you think about it, Ruth is the great grandmother of David and an ancestor to our savior, Jesus Christ. God honors her with great and beautiful posterity and gives her a right within the lineage because of her devotion and because of who she is. Transfer that onto a refugee. What refugee could be if we give them that opportunity? And so um, the treatment we provide to today's refugees will live, will have a lasting, right? It has lasting ripple effect. And the, the way that we treat them might help them discover or rediscover God. And it will definitely benefit us as a society um, as a whole. So <clears throat> we want to share two stories with you, and Robin's going to read them again, that kind of will show you this difference. When, when you do offer help to someone and how that uh, changes their trajectory versus when you don't offer that help to them, what happens? Thank you, Liz. So the first story is about Farouche and his family. In the name of God, my name is Farouche. We are from Afghanistan. I used to work in the media in Afghanistan. We didn't have economic problems there. We left our country because of security problems. I worked as a cameraman in a private television program where we made a documentary movie about the Taliban and the war. I was threatened by the Taliban several times. We went to da dangerous places like the Kandahar province to report and film. When they realized what we were doing, the Taliban attacked us. Due to the dangerous situation, we fled from Afghanistan into Iran. After that, we spent about 12 hours walking through the mountains until we arrived in Turkey. At first, I had planned to stay in Turkey, but the police arrested us. They were not nice with us, and they were not helpful. Also, Turkey was not a safe country to live in. There were two or three suicide bombings while we were there. Because of all these problems, we came here to Greece, but we don't see any progress in our situation. We have no freedom to move on to other European countries. We don't have enough money to go forward, and we don't know about our future. If peace returns to Afghanistan one day, we will definitely go back. And so this was in 2016, and we know in 2021 what just happened. I had a peaceful and good life there. I had a house and a job. The only problem was the war and the lack of life security. I think there is no solution for my country unless our leaders solve the problems. And again, we saw 
how that has evolved over time. And as August told us, um, it's not a safe place any longer. So to contrast uh, Farouche's experience, I'm going to read um, an excerpt. Leonard's story is quite long and lengthy and it's, it's in the book and it's, it's on the archive as well. Um, so I'm just going to turn and read from the slide. Or Liz will read it since she's got a book out behind her. We saw two men come and they took us. We were forced to join the military. I was 17 at the time. After six months, I heard a strong voice telling me, run Leonard, run. The closest refugee camp was in Malawi, a different country. In the refugee camp, life wasn't easy. I call it the hell on this earth. In 2004, I came to the United States. I ended up being homeless. After a week, I heard a strong voice saying, Leonard, this is not what you brought, what brought you to America. You can be better than this. You need to ask for help. If you don't ask, no one will help you. You need to ask for help. I thought, well, who can I ask for help? One Saturday morning, I saw a couple get out of the car. I followed them and I kept yelling, I need help, I need help. The wife heard me yell and then she yelled to her husband, Doug, can't we help this young man? I said, I'm a refugee from Congo and I'm homeless. He answered, oh, we have met a lot of people from Congo. We served a mission in South America. Here's my business card. On Monday, I called them and they said, we were thinking about you. Can you come live with us? I was like, uh, yeah, I will come live with you. So I went to live with them in South Jordan. They paid all of my tuition for five years and now I have a bachelor's degree. I decided to use my personal experience to help other people. So far in three years now, we have been able to help more than 100 families. I feel blessed and I feel successful. So this two stories show you a great difference, right? In first case, Farouch and his family are kind of stuck in a limbo. Um, and uh, because they were not able to get any kindness or any help, they, they probably were stuck in that limbo for many, many years. And with that limbo also comes a certain emotional tasking, right, uh, feeling. Leonard, in the other case, was met by two people who, you know, in their story, they take only a little tiny spot of that time, but their help has this ripple effect. And here he just talks about his uh, bachelor's degree. But if you read the story in the book, you can see that there's so much more to Leonard. He has done incredible things with what he was given. And you know his gratitude to this couple is immense. And because of that kindness that was extended to him, he was able to then go on and help others. And so he's been working in Utah, in, in Salt Lake City area, helping refugees. And so he's given back to the community. So <clears throat> as a result of this, what Heavenly Father is telling us is that loving others as we love ourselves provides others with the same opportunities we have been given and that it makes us an instrument of God. And that is a beautiful concept that we can be saviors on the mount in some little way. And not just that, but also that because we get involved in the lives of these people, we are enriched by it. Um, every story that I have read, every story that, um, you know, that, I, that we have collected, um, they're very hard to read for me because there are elements of my story in there too. And, and I, I am always in awe with these people, just how resilient and strong they are and how much faith they have in God. And that is something that I have learned from many of these stories, be that, you know, be that they call him Allah or that they call him God. Um, they all show that faith that God will provide and that God will be there. And that's a beautiful thing. So what effect does this have on the giver? What is the effect that we get from all of this helping other people? Um, it's not just for the goody goody feelings, but it is for our own personal spiritual progression. And in Leviticus, Heavenly Father simply outlines this very easily and Jesus reiterates it. And as we read in the scriptures, all across the scriptures, that same pattern is repeated again. Any kindness you bestow upon the others is actually 
coming back to you and it's coming back to you multifold. And um, one of the biggest one is that it's, it's creating a path to holiness. Not only are you bound to, to others and knit into a family union, but you are becoming more like heavenly father, which is the ultimate goal that we all have in this earth, right? So God gives us an open invitation to be saviors on the mount. And if we accept that call, not only will our acts of kindness define us, but they will also refine us. And I love this statement uh, by uh, Cecilia Gonzalez Andrew in, um, uh, in, in the research that she did and on this uh, topic. And she says, as we care for the refugees, we will realize that the neighbor here is the one who, as made by God, shares our imago dei. So he is image of God. He's, the countenance of God is in, reflected in him. And that as such, we are variations on a theme. We're all a variation on God's theme. The theme of finite yet strikingly beautiful and varied images of God who need each other. And we do, we need each other in order to progress to eternities. And like Robin said earlier, we want to go back to our heavenly father and bring as many of his children with us. And no better way to do that, but to extend our hands to the marginalized and disadvantaged and to those who really need that help. Um, thank you very much for being here and for listening. We are going to leave some space for questions because we thought there might be questions about the work that we do at TSOS and some of these stories. Um, and if you, you're interested in learning more, um, I am happy to share my personal story, but I don't want to put it, force it upon you if you don't want to hear it. So I will say thank you at this point and um, we are grateful for this opportunity and we're grateful to Heavenly Father that we have the resources and abilities and skills to be able to do this work. And I said it in English, just hi. Any questions? Yes, very good question. Are there any opportunities to help uh, refugees here in Utah? Actually, Utah is, is one of the states you know, across the United States that is very actively involved in this work, right? Um, currently, and I think you've seen the statement coming from the first presidency, currently there is going to be a huge influx of Afghan refugees. And so if you know of anyone that can offer housing, that's a great help. If you want to help directly, there are always needs with, you know, giving them a helping hand, teaching them how to maneuver the culture, go do grocery shopping. I mean, believe it or not, grocery stores don't look the same everywhere. <laughs> I, you know, first time I actually went shopping, it took me probably three hours to get out of the store. And I think I'm still missing probably three or four items because I just didn't know where to look for it. So that, those sort of things. But um, there are quite a few different organizations that are active here in the Valley, um, up in Salt Lake as well. And then TSOS has a chapter here on campus that you can also reach out to and uh, they organize different opportunities and they send out a newsletter with all of those details that are, you know, uh, as a student, right? If you have a little bit time, you can still do a little bit. And if you have more time, you can do a little bit more. So there are those opportunities. And, and, and our campus chapter head is Jaron Hickenlooper and he's sitting back there. You wanna, um, yeah, there you go, wave at him. <laughs> wave so, back there. So, connect with him and he can provide you with some some more information you're welcome any other questions any other questions are we are we awake oh <laughs> go ahead my story <laughs> the short version or the long? No, i'm just kidding oh can you can't hear me Is this better? No? Oh. Patrick, will you turn up the volume a little bit? Is this better? Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't hear all of our stuff. OK. Um, OK, so um, I'm not going to go into all of the details, but I do want to parallel with some of the stories that we um, you have heard, um, and probably starting with you know with the story of Farouche. Um, like Farouche's family, I you know my family had a pretty good business and had a good life. Um, we were well off; we were rich. 
but we had a good life and I was happy. I had a good, happy childhood. I have, had loving parents, um, just like Nephi. And this is, I think, what brought me to, um, to the gospel was when I started reading the Book of Mormon and I started reading the story of Nephi. It was like my story. And I just, you know, kept going into it. Um, my family was very active in um, engaging in civil society and uh, sort of a trying to speak sense into people's minds and hearts. Um, they were trying to calm down the aggressions and animosity that was happening between different, uh, um, different groups. I was born and raised in Yugoslavia, and this was right before the breakup of Yugoslavia, right? And so now I have a Serbian citizenship. So obviously the, the country broke up. And so we had a huge civil war. Within that, we also had an ethnic conflict. I am a Roma or a gypsy. So on top of all of the activism of my parents, it was also that issue that there was talk of um, purity and I was not considered pure. So I'm being purified now. If you come close and you see me, I have vitiligo. So my skin is all getting white pearl white. So I'm telling everyone I'm being celestialized. Um, but if you knew me then, you know, I had olive skin. You wouldn't tell I was Roma, but you would tell I wasn't, you know, whatever else they wanted me to be. And so my family tried to work through this as, as long as they could. Um, but when we received the drafting command for my brother, and we received enough of threats on my life and my chastity, my mother simply said, this is the point where I, this is the point of no return. I'm not going to sacrifice my children and their lives for, for this. And so we all huddled together in a little room and very hush hush decided that we were going to leave. And so we left during the, um, the season of holidays. So it wasn't evident that we were leaving and we only took uh, a handful of things with us, which we lost most of it on the way. So. I don't have very many pictures or anything. Luckily, I still had some of my documents, but not even that much of that. Um, and during our escape, I don't know how my mother, heaven was open and blessing us. There were many miracles that we actually made it into, the, uh, into Austria, but Austria was very merciless. My mother died during that flight. We stayed there and we tried to go and get some help and no one would help us because we came from the wrong side of the conflict. We were not Bosnian, we were Serbian. And it didn't matter. And my dad tried to, to share and speak and no one would listen. We got booed out of the um, Red Cross. Um, we ended up on the street, homeless for about six months. And at this point, we, uh, we actually met the church and we joined the church. And one of the elders um, sort of in undertones told the bishop that we were actually sleeping in a car in a winter cold of Austria. And so he organized um, in the stake, he asked if there anyone that could let them stay with, with them, at least through the, through the winter. And there was a, a lady in another ward who had to go and do something anyway. And she, she needed someone to house it for her. And so she graciously, without knowing us, never met us. She said, yeah, they can stay in my home. And so we stayed there um, and then the church organized a little tiny, very tiny, very tiny apartment for us. May I stress, very tiny. <laughs> we had three beds and a table and that was kind of like it. And, you know, if there are any, I don't know if there are any missionaries from that time, you know, we had so many missionaries come and visit us during that time. And it was always this, you know, who's, who's going to go first before it was just no space there. But it was, it was beautiful. We had, you know, missionaries loved us. Austrians were not very nice, but I had the gospel. And at that time, that's all I needed was Heavenly Father. That's all I needed. However, I soon realized that you need other people as well. And the kindness of the other people is what helped me. Um, there was a couple who knew that I always, want, I always dreamed of being able to get educated. And they provided resources for me to be able to do that. And I'll tell you a very brief story on that. Um, I was not allowed to go back into Yugoslavia. It was very dangerous to go back. Yet when I received um, a letter from BYU offering me a spot here, I received a scholarship um, and they graciously you know, said, we will, we will cover all of the other financial costs that the scholarship is not covering. 
And I went out to the, you know, to the consulate in Vienna, all happy that, you know, hey, something good is happening. And then I came over to that, you know, to the little window cubicle and started talking to the officer. And she looked at me and she was like, mm, well, I don't know. I think I'm going to deny your request because, yeah, you have all the papers and everything looks great, but I think you're a spy. And I just stood there sort of like, and those who know me know that I can be quite, quite sarcastic. And I stood there for a second thinking, do I give her like a really sarcastic remark? Like, oh my gosh, you found me. You're brilliant. Or do I just say, no, no, no. I just, I was just so dumbfounded. So I called a couple and I said to them, I'm, you know, I'm great, grateful for your willingness to help, but I'm not going to be able to go. There's nothing I can do. And the man very quickly said, Okay, what does that paper say? So I read what the paper said, being a diplomat, being a very wise person, he said, all right, this is what we're doing. We're driving down to Yugoslavia to the consulate there. And my eyes went like, uh, and my dad's eyes went like, uh. <laughs> so because he was a diplomat, he stopped us in his diplomatic car with his diplomatic passport, took us across the, the border, we went straight into the um, to the consulate the early that morning. As soon as we arrived, uh, the congregation there that I also never met knew about my case. They all fasted for me, and I only found that out later. We walked in there. I came again to the little window cubicle. There was this woman officer, and they started chit chatting. It's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm a diplomat. I work for State Department. La la la. And she's like, oh, I love BYU. I know BYU. I work here in Utah. Awesome write something on the paper and says, all right, well, just come get your visa back in, you know, this afternoon. <laughs> and my jaw just dropped. Yeah, thank you. And so we did, we got it. And within 24 hours, I was in and out of the country. No one knew. And it was this zoom, zoom, very risky, but a great miracle. And so to make sure that I actually made it into the country, they flew with me to BYU to make sure I can go through the customs. It's these kind of a stories, right? Just kind of with Leonard. Um, incredible people, people who I still try and keep in touch with, and people who I try to um, imitate in the things that I do, in the acts that I do because of their kindness. And, you know, they didn't have to do this, but they did because they loved me as one, their, one of their own. And they still call me their daughter. I'm sort of a, their adopted daughter, granddaughter, something. And, you know, it's, it's almost like, if you don't come and see us when you're in Utah, you're in trouble, girl. So um, I think that is, that is the point of some of these stories that really, when we get to know these personal stories, individual stories of the people, we realize there's so much more hiding be behind that label. And there's so much potential behind that label. And they recognize that. So it's just a little segment. There's a lot of more story to my story. And it was a hard road. Um, it took many, many years for me to be to feel like I am accepted and belong in Vienna, in Austria. And it's still hard for my, my dad and my brother. We still to this day do not have a Austrian citizenship. My, my situation is actually a, a limbo still, but it's okay. Everywhere that I have gone, Heavenly Father has provided. And um, I'm grateful for that. But many refugees don't have that help and resource. And this is where Heavenly Father says, it's upon you as covenant people to provide those resources for them. So that's just a little wrap up. Any other story, uh, questions? <laughs> no, I'm doing the same thing Robin did. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to those who endured through all of these lectures. And uh, if you have any other questions, we do have a little table outside so we can answer anything else about our work. And thank you to the Sperry Symposium for allowing us to be here and to present. <laughs>